Well, uh, hello er again, everyone, uh, or to you. Uh, glad you've joined us or joined me for um, this time of Bible study as we continue our walk through the book of Isaiah. This is part of our Sunday School curriculum, and if this is your first time tuning in, I just want to extend a special welcome to you, and thank you uh, for being a part. Now, even though we are midway through, kind of really almost two-thirds of the way through the book of Isaiah, uh, today's lesson should be something that you can glean from, something you can learn from, and uh, just kind of pick up. So really glad uh, that you've joined us today, and, and really hope it's God's time and in your life for, for that. Uh, before we, we jump in, I want to pray for us and pray for, um, for you and for our time. Father, we give you thanks for your word and the, the privilege and the responsibility that we have to learn it and learn of you in it. Father, thank you that it is indeed true and trustworthy. And Father, that, um, that we can count on it in the midst of, of all of the seasons of our life, in good times and in bad, in, um, in seasons where we don't see any of uh, what we read about, and then in seasons where it, it just overflows us. Uh, so Lord, thank you for your presence in all of it. We pray that you bless our time and uh, the reading and teaching of your word, that you'd be honored and glorified, and that your people would continue to change. So, uh, we're going to look a little bit today at Isaiah chapter 40, and specifically we're going to, the, the text of Sunday School starts with verse 12 to the end of the chapter, but I, I want to have just a, a bit of a diversion, I guess, uh, as, we, as we begin. Um, a reminder, or maybe news to some of you, that the fact that Israel, that Judah, uh, that, that, that God's people worshipped one God, a single God, they were monotheistic. The fact that that, that was the case um, was just unheard of in the ancient world. Uh, they were very polytheistic. There were gods for everything, gods and goddesses. If you remember your um, Edith Hamilton Greek mythology stuff from back in the day, even preceding all of that, there were gods for everything. And, and just so you wouldn't forget, and since there were things that were, were uh, most folks were illiterate and couldn't read, Instead of having uh, sacred writings for a lot of those gods, they had idols. They had little totems. So uh, something like this, for instance. Not that this is one that says Florida, but uh, this um, is an elephant. And so maybe perhaps this, this little thing somebody would have in their house and it would represent power and strength or it would represent um, something, I don't know. But they would keep that to remind them of or, or even to, to give homage to, to pay tribute to um, this God, the God of animals, or the God of uh, sunshine, or whatever it happened to be, right? Um, and P.S., the person, I think, that gave me this, or somebody told me along the lines, that if you get an elephant, or give an elephant as a totem, or as a gift to somebody, the trunk has to be up, that it signifies good luck. Now, if you believe that, then at some level, you're believing in idols. <laughs> it's probably, you know, it's just a, it's an interesting fact there, but uh, anyway, that probably doesn't bring you good luck. But so, um, so, so the average person in, um, in ancient times probably had several idols like this that reminded them. They would have them around at their house. They would carry them with them. So some they would, they would want to carry. They'd be smaller than this that maybe would fit in a knapsack. They could keep in their pocket kind of close to them, especially if it had, uh, had some meaning. So, so this would, would be an idol. Uh, this idol uh, comes from Jeff Meek's office. It's a uh, picture of Liberace. No, I'm kidding. That's not really true, but I just thought that would be funny to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but for, for some, maybe they had a larger statue, kind of like this. It would be in a prominent place in the house. This, is, this isn't an idol. This is just a bust of uh, Felix Mendelssohn, the composer. Um, but maybe if this was uh, some revered god or revered deity, something in, in the person's house, they would have this exalted kind of in a prominent place displaying, you know, kind of looking over uh, the events of the home and the house and just kind of guarding over that. And it would be a reminder to them, or maybe a false, really a false hope for them, that they were being protected, that, they, that, they, that their God was with them. But what would happen when Junior and Bubba would play football or kickball or whatever it would be in, 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 the, in the main room and all of a sudden knock this off of the, of the man were off the shelf and it landed on the ground and broke into a gazillion pieces. What would happen then? How would that play out? You know, what would happen when that, when that idol burst? Um, but yeah, there were a gazillion of them. Now, as a matter of fact, we have idols 
today, and um, I'm going to show you a picture of one. Maybe it'll, hopefully it'll come across on this video. But uh, the largest idol in the world is the Spring Temple. I feel like Mr. Rogers coming a little closer, children. Uh, the Spring Temple Buddha. This is in um, the county of Luhan, China, I believe. It's, it's in China somewhere. Um, but it is, including base, this idol itself is 500 feet tall. 500 feet. Can you imagine how massive that is and how, uh, how far away you could see this as, you, um, as you're approaching the area and how, how that would be just an imposing uh, image to see? I mean, just to give you just a little bit of reference, that's about 150 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty that we have in New York Harbor. Um, and it is almost as tall, about 50 feet short of the Washington Monument. This is in Washington, D.C. If you've ever seen that, look how tall that is. 500 feet in the air uh, is this sp uh, Spring Temple Buddha. Um, I remember when I was a kid going to this uh, park at Stone Mountain and looking at that carving and then going inside the little shop and they showed where you bought the little book and there were pictures of the process of the people carving those images into uh, that big massive piece of granite and I don't know if it was Robert E. Lee's horse or Jeff Stewart's horse but one of the horses you know a six-foot man could stand in there in the mouth of the horse and that gave you just this sense of this how big that carving was but from far away it looked kind of small so this idol was massive. I mean, could you imagine what that would look like imposing? I mean, you just see that in the neighborhood, how huge that would be and what that would what that would look like. I want you to keep that image in mind as we think about uh, these people. The people, the children of Israel, uh, the tribe of Judah, God's chosen folks. Uh, they have been conquered by the Assyrians and they're about to go into Babylonian exile. They are, they're about to be captured and taken away. They're going to be surrounded by a gazillion idols, some of them tiny, some of them a lot bigger, some of them super imposing, casting a shadow, always around. Can you imagine being in the city where this is? You could not look anywhere and not see it and not have this imposing sense of, of that. So, um, but in the midst of that, and, and how, how um, awesome it is for us, at Kaioki, our vision statement begins with, we want to declare the greatness of of God, to declare the greatness of God. So in the midst of this polytheistic place where they're going to be dragged off and taken into captivity, Isaiah wants them to get a sense of the greatness of God. In the midst of all of these potential influences, whether they are tiny household objects that you just kind of see everywhere, a gazillion gods that people are, are bowing down to, or some sort of massive imposing statue, you need to realize that, that our God is great. So last time we were together, we looked at Isaiah chapter 38, and the king at that time, Hezekiah, got sick, but he prayed to God, God healed him, and he became the talk of the town. As a result of that healing, uh, folks came by to see him and check him out, and he was kind of proud of all of that, and envoys from Babylon came to see him, and he showed them everything. They took inventory, and they're like, you know what, this is probably a place we need to come back and visit with troops, and they did. So, right now we're gonna uh, we're gonna shift gears a bit and go into Isaiah chapter forty. Um, Isaiah chapter forty. So here Isaiah is writing to a group of people that were not yet born. That would be that would probably uh, experience this a hundred plus years after he he wrote it. He looks forward to um, the events that are going to occur. Um, in the life of these people, but not in the lives of the original hearers. Um, he writes to the folks that are going to be in Babylonian captivity, and, um, and he wants them to realize that in the midst of that, they are still God's people, and they need to be, to, to be steady and sure and certain of God's promises in the midst of this other culture. Though they may not be able to see how God to deliver them from captivity. They may not be able to see how God was active and present in the midst of their current struggle. That God, uh, his will is unthwartable and his word stands forever. And God's promise to return would be fulfilled and he will be faithful to fill that promise. Isaiah wants to tell them that. And so as one way to do that, 
towards the end, our focus uh, passage is um, Isaiah starting at, at 40, starting at verse 12. So from 12 all the way through 31 at the end of the chapter, Isaiah encourages them to consider and to mull over and to meditate on how great and mighty and true the one true God, their God, really is. And so as, uh, as, as maybe if you're a, a member of our church or you've been around Kaioki for a while and you've heard or you've read uh, that we declare the greatness of God and we want to declare that to our children, we want to declare that to our community, to ourselves. Um, and we declare it through song as we gather together for, for corporate worship. A lot of our songs exalt the goodness and greatness of God. Uh, but the question, maybe a question for you and for me, is have you considered that greatness? What does that mean that God is great? And how, how can we um, grasp the ungraspable without just kind of getting mar mired down in the details? You know, earlier in Isaiah chapter 6, um, Isaiah has an encounter with God that just blows him away, that, that, that really sets him up for this, um, for this journey. And he is, he is gripped by the greatness of God in that encounter. But how can we, without having one of those experiences, leaning on God's word and our understanding, um, develop and meditate on the greatness of God? Consider it. So, uh, we're going to look, beginning at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Here's what he says. Uh, and we'll probably stop as we, as we, as we truck on. Oh, you know what? Let, let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll set up a little bit of context. Isaiah chapter 40 begins with a great promise. So, so up to this point, uh, Isaiah is kind of condemning the children of Israel for, for their disobedience. And, uh, and, and Assyria has come in and taken them up. And Babylon, Babylon is going to come and, and take them as well. They're going to be, um, uh, they're going to experience some difficulty, right? But God will redeem them. God is going to rescue them somewhere down the road. And so there's this rescue that's going to come for, um, when Cyrus becomes the king of Persia and he con conquers Babylon and allows the, the Jews to return to their homeland. That's, that's predicted in this. But also there's another deliverance. There's a, a greater deliverance that, um, that is uh, prophesied here. And that is, of course, the coming of Jesus. And so in chapter 40, starting uh, early on, we see just a little bit some more of this messianic prophecy and also see if you can hear this, a prophecy about uh, John the Baptist as well. And so here's what it says in Isaiah 40, chapter, verse, chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that what? That her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned. Now, she probably wanted that warfare to end, but probably had no idea that it was the iniquity that needed pardoning. But, but, but Isaiah is saying that, you know what, her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned. And she has received from the Lord's hand a double portion for her sins. And here's the John the Baptist piece. And the voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. And every mountain and hill be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level. And the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Then in verse 9, this is what he's encouraging them to do, to declare the greatness of God. He says, Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of the good news. Lift it up, fear not. Behold the cities, to the, say to the cities of Judah, excuse me, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And in some ways, he is saying to us, saying to you, right there in your living room, maybe on your phone, behold your God. Take a moment. Think about who God is. Behold him. Cast your eyes upon him. In the midst of all this stuff that you're looking at that's in your periphery, that maybe you're looking at, you're focusing on captivity, maybe you're focusing on your yearning for home, focusing on the, the idols that are all around you. And Isaiah says, behold your God. Behold him. Look at him. And then he goes on to say, Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with 
young. So he, he, he is prophesying the coming of the Messiah, God's ultimate victory over sin and his redemption for his people. And uh, what a great promise that is. And a, and a challenge and an encouragement to them in the midst of difficulty to meditate on, to think about, to declare the greatness of God. Now, to, um, to our passage. Next verse, chapter 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in balance. Now think about that. Consider how great and mighty and awesome your God is. You've got this, you got this guy on the in the pocket, or maybe this guy on the mantle or on the shelf, or maybe even the Spring Temple Buddha, some sort of massive totem in the town square that would just tower over everything. And here's what he says. Who measured all of the water that exists in his hand? Can you imagine the disparity, the difference between a 500 foot tall statue, which is superimposing, and a God that can hold all of the waters in the palm of his hand, in the hollow of his hand? Isn't that incredible? I remember back in the day when our children were young, we went, uh, it was in the heat of summer, and decided to buy one of those little kiddie pools. Let me rephrase that. Not a little kiddie pool, not one of the ones that you could get your ankles deep in, but like the bordering on awesome redneck kiddie pool that you, it took like an hour to fill. It was just huge. They had a big time. They were splashing around. It just cooled off, and it was just a great deal until after a while, uh, I don't know how many gallons of water it held, but it was, you know, it was pretty big around. But after a while, that just got old. And after a while, that water got hot. And after a while, the dog started getting in there too. And, and it just became something that they never wanted to play in again. And of course, Lynn, my wife, said, you know, honey, let's, let's uh, empty that thing out. Let's rinse it out. And maybe we can do it again. I said, sure, okay, I'll go. And so I go to, uh, to dump the water out of this kiddie pool, which is a pretty big kiddie pool. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this or not. But it couldn't budge. It was like, my goodness, this is, this is really heavy. You know, I'm lifting up on it, and the thing is bending, and some of the water is sloshing out the side. So basically, I just kind of had to rock an amount of water out to where I could finally lift it and dump it over. I know that's a silly analogy, but um, if you've ever done that, if you've carried like five gallons of water or something, it's, it's really heavy. Can you imagine the greatness and vastness of God who holds all of the water of the earth? They could just kind of fit easily in the palm of his hand, right? And this is what Isaiah has encouraged them to think about this. This is the God. This is our God. And, and then he goes on to say, enclosed, uh, who marked off the heavens with a span and enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance, right? So the dust on the scales, and he can, he can actually weigh the mountains and the hills on a balance, right? He just pick these up here. Let me take this one. Let me just put uh, you know, the Smoky Mountains over here. We'll put this. We'll have the Rockies over here. We'll just kind of. Could you imagine? Think about the greatness of God. Verse thirteen: Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows in his counsel? So not only God's great creation, but His wisdom and His power and might. Who gives the Lord counsel? And when He did this, verse fourteen says, "Who did He consult?" And who made him understand? And who taught God the path of justice? And who taught him knowledge? And showed him every way of understanding? I uh, kind of remind you a little bit of that, of that um, uh, discussion slash lecture that the Lord gives Job. You know, Job complains or he talks for about 30 whatever chapters. Then all of a sudden God speaks and he says, listen, pal, where were you in the midst of all of this? And um, that's my translation, obviously, not the Lord's. He was pretty, pretty young. Um, I've read about it. Uh, but so who, who, has done, who, who has done this? You know who has done this, Jerusalem? Your God. Not these, not these phonies that are all around you. Not these, uh, these, these faux uh, gods with a low, uh, lowercase g, but the one true God. The great God. Think about these things. Realize that. Have faith in that in the midst of your ca captivity. And all these nations who have come in and have kind of uh, impose their will on you uh, over time. Verse 17, uh, excuse me, verse 15 says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, 
counted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Or as my granddad used to say, above on the windshield. You know, if you remember those, just a little tiny, it's nothing. These huge nations are nothing flicked uh, compared to who God is. He compares uh, God to the gods of the nations that have, and the, uh, the idols. I mean, there's just no comparison there. But we have to make our time to think about that, especially in the midst of a difficult time, in the midst of captivity. And then verse 16, he says, Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. Now, I'm not sure if you uh, can catch what he's saying there, but um, maybe if you um, have uh, been a, a student of Scripture at all, the, 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 the place where some of the finest wood came from, and a lot of... Uh, temple furnishings and, and other um, desired nice places. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure where that came from. That was just a terrible description. It came from the, the cedars of Lebanon. That's where that comes from. So the, the, the Lebanon was known for their massive trees and, and, and the incredible timber that would come from them. And so here's what Lebanon wouldn't suffice for fuel. So in other words, this is how um, Eugene Peterson translates this in the message. He says this, verses 16 and 17. There aren't enough trees in Lebanon, nor enough animals in those vast forests to furnish adequate fuel and offerings for worship. If they were to take all of that stuff, make this massive bonfire, a fire of, on the altar to offer an offering to our great God. If they were to take every beast of the field, slaughter them, drain them of blood, and offer them before them, there it would just not be enough. That's how great God is. And so, in all the nations that are, they add up as nothing before him. They are counted as less than nothing. Emptiness. A minus. A zero. Um, how powerful is our Lord? Um, I read somewhere. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's drop on. Okay, to whom then will you liken God? Verse 18, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it. A goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot and seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Uh, if you've got a Bible with you, I didn't ask you earlier, hopefully you'll have that. Uh, hold your place there in Isaiah chapter 40 and turn back to Psalm 115, about two or three books over, Psalm 115. Uh, verse 2, why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. Now think about that, right? Totally inanimate and incapable of movement, of making of anything. They're incapable. But then here's the, here's the key verse. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Those who make them become like them. And so do all who trust in them. So you know what they become like? They become powerless become helpless. They become immobile. And so you and I may not have idols of, of ivory or gold or silver or, or, or um, plaster, but we do have them. Things that we put in our, in our kind of God sacred substitutes in our, that we kind of think will give us satisfaction, will give us ultimate joy, that will give us some sort of feeling of identity. Right? Um, but as Psalm 115 says, and as we find out in Isaiah, those who make them become like them. And uh, we're challenged, we're called to be transformed, to become like the one we worship. We become like that which we worship, right? What if we were to become more like, like Christ? Verse 21, do you not know, do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing. He makes the rulers 
of this earth emptiness. Um, so as we think about this great and powerful and glorious and good God over us, um, I'm not an astronomer, astronomer, I can't even say it. Um, my wife and I have been watching the uh, Disney Plus uh, uh, the Right Stuff series about the early astronauts of our country, those seven guys that were chosen to kind of be the first to, to lead us into space and just the vastness of all that, and that's just kind of cool to think about that and then going to the moon back then. Um, but if you think about the greatness and vastness of God who created and named all the stars, uh, astrologists tell us that our Milky Way, there are 100,000 excuse me, 100,000 million stars in our galaxy. And some of them, many of them, brighter than the sun that we have. Um, but yet it is our God who calls that into being and who calls them all by name. That's your God, children of Israel, and that is our God, Kaioki. Uh, he is indeed great and powerful and glorious. Verse 24, scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, gone. And the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Okay, so they've talked about all these different attributes of God. Here's what he created, here's what he did, here's his power. And just a reminder, says the Holy One, lift up your eyes and see who created these things. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? And okay, so here we go. After this long stretch of God's going to come and redeem in the midst of your difficulty, you don't necessarily know it, but he's going to come, you're going to be uh, freed from Babylonian captivity, and P.S., you're going to be freed from your sins by the becoming Messiah, right? In the midst of that, talks about the greatness of God, uh, in comparison, incomparable, really, to anything that they have known or seen or heard, anything that's around them. Then he says this, verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God? The everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint nor grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. He knows all. He understands all. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. And somebody probably needs to hear that today. Maybe, okay, let me rephrase that. We all need to hear that every day, right? Um, there are times when you just get weary, right? Um, Paul reminds us to not grow weary in doing good, but just to continue to be faithful. God will restore us. And um, then he, he goes on and says, verse 30, Even youth shall grow faint and be weary, um, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That's a great verse for us today. Great verse for you. Great verse for me. Um, that word wait is also a word hope, when our hope is put on the Lord. If our hope is put in idols, if our hope is put on circumstances, if our hope is placed in the success of our uh, football, favorite football team, the, uh, the accomplishments of our children, the, um, the, the, the rays that may be coming somewhere down the road, the sale of our house, this boat that I'm, if our success, if our happiness is based on that, we will certainly uh, be disappointed. But those whose hope is in the Lord, in the midst of this exile, in the midst of this captivity, if you, for those whose hope is in the Lord, it will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. That's pretty high. It's pretty, pretty strong. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Maybe you could take some time to uh, reread that entire chapter. And uh, I'd encourage you to get a... a three-by-five card or a post-it marker, and um, just write down those last three verses out by hand. Read them every day. And say, so, Lord, would you help me to understand your greatness so that...
So in the context of what we, we just read, the, the, so as you write down those, those three verses, just think about what preceded that. All that Isaiah mentions, all that he reminds us of, all that he reminds uh, the children of Israel of in that time. God's goodness, God's gloriousness, his, his vastness, his superiority over all of those things, his uh, incredible wisdom and might. It is this God who will give us the strength to live the life that we need to live uh, today. And we, we think about, and we need to think about, they were thinking about deliverance from the oppression that was over them, deliverance from captivity, um, and that would happen, and what a great freedom that was, but yet still they were still sinful. Uh, if God took them out, they would still be sinful and wherever he put them. And so we were, held bondage, by, we were held in bondage to that as well, but yet Christ uh, ultimately is the one who um, frees us from that, and we live in, in new life in him. And so... Um, when he says that he gives us new life, we will run and not be weary, we will walk and not faint. Um, that's because of who Christ is and what he's done for us. And I pray that that would be your reality and um, that God would make his glorious known, his gloriousness known to you today. Thanks a lot.